In 1663, in a mine southwest of Magdeburg, Germany, a collection of bones was unearthed that led Prussian scientist Otto von Guericke to believe they had found the remains of an actual, real-life unicorn. While his original reconstruction has been lost, we do know what it allegedly looked like based on drawings by other scientists from both 1714 and 1749. And though there has been some debate about whether von Guericke believed the entire skeleton to be intact, these artist renditions seem to suggest that for a time, it was considered to be a complete animal. This has led many to dub this the worst fossil reconstruction in human history. And modern recreations of this monstrosity have become tourist attractions and also regularly get shared on social media. The Magdeburg unicorn was no doubt the product of unknowingly mixing several different skeletons together, though the exact species involved has yet to be conclusively confirmed. Some suggest it was the combination of horse bones and the tusk of a woolly mammoth, while another theory involves the skull of a woolly rhinoceros, the legs of a woolly mammoth, and the tusk of a narwhal. While this is definitely the most extreme example, the Magdeburg Unicorn really illustrates the early struggles of trying to reconstruct ancient life, something that actually continued to be an ongoing issue well into the 20th century. And while one can understand and sympathize with these attempts to recreate the unknown, it can also be entertaining to look back at the weird and often unbelievable ideas that were presented by some of the greatest minds of the time. So sit back and enjoy this collection of some of the worst fossil reconstructions and paleo art ever made. In the rush to be the first to identify a new species, many dinosaurs were named by their discoverers well before their physical characteristics and biology were fully understood. One of the most well-known examples of this is the Stegosaurus, which earned its scientific name meaning roofed lizard due to the early belief that its plates lay flat over its back like the tiles of a roof. But despite that name being quickly adopted, other theories about its appearance were also debated through the late 1800s. The fragmented nature of early skeletons meant there was still a lot of missing pieces to fill in. Here's one of the first popular reconstructions found in the November 1884 issue of Scientific America, which shows the stegosaurus as having a long neck and moving on two legs. Also, the dinosaur's odd cylindrical teeth were found spread around the excavation site, which led them to initially being misinterpreted as back spikes. So if we were to name this version based on what we know now, I guess it would have to be the Denotosaurus, or Toothback Lizard, which I think illustrates that no matter how wrong it is, dinosaur naming conventions always sound cool. Over the next few decades, several different variations of the stegosaurus were imagined. This 1896 drawing by the dinosaur's original collector, Charles Marsh, showed all the back plates in a single row, and double the actual tail spikes. While this illustration from 1899 seems to revert back to the turtle armor-like roof lizard design. But the most ridiculous reconstruction of the stegosaurus came courtesy of Dr. W. H. Ballou in the August 1920 edition of the Ogden Standard Examiner. Based on a combination of accurate information that the plates were not connected to the spinal column and the incorrect belief that the animal was lighter than originally thought, Dr. Ballou suggested that the plates could be articulated sideways and used to glide through the air, making the stegosaurus, and I quote, the weird and titanic flying squirrel of its age. We now move on from something that someone thought could fly, but actually couldn't, to an animal that at first was assumed to be flightless, even though it wasn't. Thus making this the most overly complicated segue I've ever written. First discovered in the late 1700s, this pterosaur skeleton puzzled German scientists as the concepts of ancient life and extinction were not fully understood at the time. After concluding that it was not a bird or a bat, they decided it must be a marine animal, since the ocean was more likely to house unknown species that hadn't been discovered yet and the idea that its long limbs could be used as paddles to swim extended well into the early 1800s. Meanwhile, French biologist Georges Cuvier correctly deduced that the long fourth finger of the skeleton was used to support a wing membrane, and the name pterodactyl, or wing finger, was adopted for these skeletons as early as 1801. But how exactly the finger worked was not completely understood, as displayed in this early reconstruction that shows the finger connecting all the way back to the body at the back legs. Another popular theory was that the pterosaur was a mammal, or at least an intermediate between birds and mammals while English zoologist Edward Newman had an even more bizarre idea, envisioning them as flying marsupials, complete with ears and a pouch, as shown in this illustration from 1843. And for our final crazy pterosaur reconstruction, we have Thomas Hawkins' 1840 Book of the Great Sea Dragons, where he suggested that the great reptiles of the Mesozoic era were created by the devil, describing pterosaurs as an engrafted by evil stock. When Russian botanist Mikhail Adams was led to the remains of a large, hair-covered creature in the frozen tundra of Siberia, he was disappointed to find that wild animals had eaten a lot of the exposed flesh, including, unknowingly to him, the trunk. Thus, the first illustrated interpretation of the remains ended up looking like this. 
no doubt due to the belief that an elephant-like animal couldn't have resided in such a climate, Adam seems to have originally imagined this as some kind of large boar-like creature, with a tusk orientation I can only assume was inspired by the mustaches of the day. Meanwhile, at this very same time, America was uncovering its own complete version of the mammoth, later called the Mastodon. Exhumed by Charles Wilson Peel in 1801 near Newburgh, New York, it ended up being one of the first prehistoric animal skeletons to ever be mounted, which unsurprisingly meant there was a slight mistake. Peel envisioned these beasts as mighty carnivores that roamed the land devouring buffalo, deer, and elk. And whether as an honest mistake or a ploy to encourage people to attend his museum, the tusks at first were mounted downward like fangs in order to magnify its ferocity. But this understanding was soon proven to be incorrect bringing a disappointing end to America's right to claim that their mammoth could beat up all the other mammoths. After acquiring the fossilized remains of a massive 80-foot seropod, Carnegie Museum paleontologist William Holland mounted it for display in an elephant-like posture that we now know was the right approach, with the legs directly beneath the body. But several fellow scientists claimed his reconstruction was all wrong. Since dinosaurs were reptiles, they must have sprawled like alligators, as demonstrated in this brilliant artwork you see here. But Holland was more than prepared to defend his work. An article in the 1910 American Naturalist was directed specifically at one of his adversaries, a German zoologist named Gustav Tornier. In it, Holland provides some of his own hilariously wrong paleo art, and uses it to expertly discredit the bow-legged dinosaur theories. He first calls Tournier's idea a skeletal monstrosity, adding, as a contribution to the literature of caricature, the success achieved is remarkable. He then goes on to theorize how such an animal would traverse the world, his words laced with early 1900 sarcasm. It has been suggested that kindly nature, to the requirements of the case, must have channeled the surface of the earth and provided the Diplodocus and its allies with troughs in which to keep their bodies while their feet were employed for the purpose of locomotion along the banks. The Diplodocus must have moved in a groove or a rut. This might perhaps account for its early extinction. It is physically and mentally bad to get in a rut. As an interesting side note, in my research I read that once the idea that seropods were not sprawl-legged was fully accepted, a new problem was soon identified. Calculations seemed to show that these large animals would actually not be able to support themselves on land, which gave rise to a theory that they spent most of their time partially submerged in lakes, especially if they were to be able to breed without crushing each other. Now this too ended up being later proven incorrect, but I think it might have inspired this 1930s medical advertisement, which seems to be saying that even if you were as dirty as a sauropod sex swamp, they can still help you out. If it wasn't for the Magdabug Unicorn, this would probably take the award for the most outrageous paleo art in the whole video. Especially when you find out the source is surprisingly recent. When a young earth creationist is trying to prove the belief that the fire-breathing creatures mentioned in the Bible were actually dinosaurs, the Parasaurolophus is the species of choice due to its large head crest. The idea is that the hollow chambers inside the crest would hold different chemicals that would then mix and create fire when contacting air, with the real-life example of the bombarder beetle being cited as proof of the process, even though technically the beetle produces a burning fluid, not fire. While a scientific counter to these wild claims is probably pointless, in his book on the subject, Professor of Zoology Philip J. Center makes it pretty clear that there's no way such a process would be possible without injuring the animal. Though notably, the actual function of the crest and its internal nasal passages is still not fully understood today, with the leading theories being a visual display for identifying species and sex, sound amplification for communication, and thermal regulation. You will note that combustion chamber does not make this list. Interestingly, some of the most inaccurate paleoart and prehistoric life restorations might still be happening right now. Let me explain. Suppose you come to Earth as an alien scientist a million years from now and dig up a fossil of this skull. Now perhaps you employ some of the same techniques used today to imagine what this giant toothed creature might look like. But the reality is, you found a hippopotamus. A dangerous animal, no doubt, but not quite the look you originally envisioned. You see, some of the scientific community have recently started to criticize a common technique used on dinosaurs that has been dubbed skin wrapping or shrink wrapping. And to reinforce that point, books like All Yesterdays have applied that same method used for prehistoric animals on modern ones to show how they might have been interpreted if we only had their bones to work with. And the results are pretty wild. These are swans. And this is a baboon. For another example, we could look at how whale skeletons compare to their actual body shape which should really drive home the point that we might be way off when it comes to our understanding of dinosaur anatomy. One of the more humorous, though unlikely comparisons I found, was one that applied the physical logic of a penguin skeleton to envision a very chalky seropod. 
and while something like this painting here might have at one time been considered very bad paleo art by someone with a weird imagination, the reality is there is a lot about these ancient creatures we just do not know. And based on some of the unique animals we have in our world today, maybe this isn't really that far-fetched after all. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more weird history, I would like to encourage you to hit that subscribe button and check out some of my other content that is on your screen right now. Also, for those that want to become more involved in the channel, you will find Discord and Patreon links in the description and pinned comment below. My name is Sledge, thanks for watching.